The Angel by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Angel Whenever a good child dies, an angel of God comes down from heaven, takes the dead child in his arms, spreads out his great white wings, and flies with him over all the places which the child had loved during his life. Then he gathers a large handful of flowers, which he carries up to the Almighty, that they may bloom more brightly in heaven than they do on earth and the Almighty presses the flowers to his heart, but he kisses the flower that pleases him best, and it receives a voice and is able to join the song of the chorus of bliss. These words were spoken by an angel of God as he carried a dead child up to heaven, and the child listened as if in a dream. Then they passed over well-known spots where the little one had often played and through beautiful gardens full of lovely flowers. Which of these shall we take with us to heaven to be transplanted there? asked the angel. Close by grew a slender, beautiful rosebush, but some wicked hand had broken the stem, and the half-opened rosebuds hung faded and withered on the trailing branches. Poor rosebush, said the child, let us take it with us to heaven, that it may bloom above in God's garden. The angel took up the rosebush, then he kissed the child, and the little one half-opened his eyes. The angel gathered also some beautiful flowers, as well as a few humble buttercups and heart's ease. Now we have flowers enough, said the child. But the angel only nodded. He did not fly upward to heaven. It was night and quite still in the great town. Here they remained, and the angel hovered over a small, narrow street in which lay a large heap of straw ashes and sweepings from the houses of people who had removed there lay fragments of plates pieces of plaster rags old hats and other rubbish not pleasant to see amidst all this confusion the angel pointed to the pieces of a broken flower pot and to a lump of earth which had fallen out of it. The earth had been kept from falling to pieces by the roots of a withered field flower which had been thrown amongst the rubbish. We will take this with us, said the angel. I will tell you why as we fly along. And as they flew, the angel related the history. Down in that narrow lane, in a low cellar, lived a poor, sick boy. He had been afflicted from his childhood, and even in his best days, he could just manage to walk up and down the room on crutches once or twice, but no more. During some days in summer, the sunbeams would lie on the floor of the cellar for about half an hour. In this spot, the poor sick boy would sit warming himself in the sunshine and watching the red blood through his delicate fingers as he held them before his face. Then he would say he had been out, yet he knew nothing of the green forest in its spring verdure till a neighbor's son brought him a green bough from a beech tree. This he would place over his head and fancy that he was in the beech wood while the sun shone and the birds caroled gaily. 
One spring day, the neighbor's boy brought him some field flowers, and among them was one to which the root still adhered. This he carefully planted in a flower pot and placed in a window seat near his bed. And the flower had been planted by a fortunate hand, for it grew, put forth fresh shoots, and blossomed every year. It became a splendid flower garden to the sick boy and his little treasure upon earth. He watered it and cherished it and took care it should have the benefit of every sunbeam that found its way into the cellar from the earliest morning ray to the evening sunset. The flower entwined itself even in his dreams. For him it bloomed. For him spread its perfume, and it gladdened his eyes, and to the flower he turned even in death when the Lord called him. He has been one year with God. During that time, the flower has stood in the window, withered and forgotten, till at length cast out among the sweepings into the street on the day of the lodger's removal. And this poor flower, withered and faded as it is, we have added to our nosegay because it gave more real joy than the most beautiful flower in the garden of a queen. But how do you know all this? asked the child whom the angel was carrying to heaven. I know it, said the angel, because I myself was the poor sick boy who walked upon crutches, and I know my own flower well. Then the child opened his eyes and looked into the glorious happy face of the angel, and at the same moment they found themselves in that heavenly home where all is happiness and joy, and God pressed the dead child to his heart, and wings were given him, so that he could fly with the angel hand in hand. Then the Almighty pressed all the flowers to his heart, but he kissed the withered field flower, and it received a voice. Then it joined in the song of the angels who surrounded the throne, some near and others in a distant circle, but all equally happy. They all joined in the chorus of praise, both great and small, the good, happy child and the poor field flower that once lay withered and cast away on a heap of rubbish in a narrow, dark street. End of The Angel by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Jill Preston The Butterfly by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Butterfly There was once a butterfly who wished for a bride, and, as may be supposed, he wanted to choose a very pretty one from among the flowers. He glanced, with a very critical eye, at all the flower beds, and found that the flowers were seated quietly and demurely on their stalks, just as maidens should sit before they are engaged. But there was a great number of them, and it appeared as if his search would become very wearisome. The butterfly did not like to take too much trouble, so he flew off on a visit to the daisies. The French call this flower Marguerite, and they say that the little daisy can prophesy. Lovers pluck off the leaves, and as they pluck each leaf, they ask a question about their lovers. Thus, does he or she love me? Ardently? Distractedly? Very much? A little? Not at all? 
and so on. Everyone speaks these words in his own language. The butterfly came also to Marguerite to inquire, but he did not pluck off her leaves. He pressed a kiss on each of them, for he thought there was always more to be done by kindness. Darling Marguerite Daisy, he said to her, you are the wisest woman of all the flowers. Pray tell me which of the flowers I shall choose for my wife. Which will be my bride? When I know, I will fly directly to her and propose. But Marguerite did not answer him. She was offended that he should call her a woman when she was only a girl, and there is a great difference. He asked her a second time, and then a third, but she remained dumb and answered not a word. Then he would wait no longer, but flew away, to commence his wooing at once. It was in the early spring, when the crocus and the snowdrop were in full bloom. They are very pretty, thought the butterfly, charming little lasses, but they are rather formal. Then, as the young lads often do, he looked out for the elder girls. He next flew to the anemones. These were rather sour to his taste. The violet, a little too sentimental. The lime blossoms, too small, and besides, there was such a large family of them. The apple blossoms, though they look like roses, bloomed today, but might fall off tomorrow with the first wind that blew and he thought that a marriage with one of them might last too short a time. The pea blossom pleased him most of all. She was white and red, graceful and slender, and belonged to those domestic maidens who have a pretty appearance and can yet be useful in the kitchen. He was just about to make her an offer when... Close by the maiden, he saw a pod with a withered flower hanging at the end. Who is that? he asked. That is my sister, replied the pea blossom. Oh, indeed. And you will be like her some day, said he. And he flew away directly, for he felt quite shocked. A honeysuckle hung forth from the hedge in full bloom but there were so many girls like her with long faces and sallow complexions. No, he did not like her, but which one did he like? Spring went by and summer drew towards its close. Autumn came, but he had not decided. The flowers now appeared in their most gorgeous robes, but all in vain. They had not the fresh fragrant air of youth, for the heart asks for fragrance, even when it is no longer young, and there is very little of that to be found in the dahlias or the dry chrysanthemums. Therefore the butterfly turned to the mint on the ground. You know, this plant has no blossom, but it is sweetness all over, full of fragrance from head to foot, with the scent of a flower in every leaf. I will take her, said the butterfly, and he made her an offer. But the mint stood silent and stiff as she listened to him. At last, she said, Friendship, if you please, nothing more. I am old and you are old, but we may live for each other just the same as to marrying. No, don't let us appear ridiculous at our age. And so it happened that the butterfly got no wife at all. He had been too long choosing, which is always a bad plan, and the butterfly became what is called an old bachelor. It was late in the autumn with rainy and cloudy weather. The cold wind blew over the bowed backs of the willows. 
so that they creaked again. It was not the weather for flying about in summer clothes, but fortunately the butterfly was not out in it. He had got a shelter by chance. It was in a room heated by a stove and as warm as summer. He could exist here, he said, well enough. But it is not enough merely to exist, said he. I need freedom, sunshine, and a little flower for a companion. Then he flew against the window pane and was seen and admired by those in the room who caught him and stuck him on a pin in a box of curiosities. They could not do more for him. Now I am perched on a stalk like the flowers, said the butterfly. It is not very pleasant, certainly. I should imagine it is something like being married, for here I am stuck fast. And with this thought he consoled himself a little. That seems very poor consolation, said one of the plants in the room that grew in a pot. Ah, thought the butterfly. One can't very well trust these plants in pots. They have too much to do with mankind. End of The Butterfly by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Jill Preston Fairy Tales by the Brothers Grimm Dr. Nowell. There was, once upon a time, a poor peasant called Crab, who drove with two oxen a load of wood to the town and sold it to a doctor for two tailors. When the money was being counted out to him, it so happened that the doctor was sitting at the table, and when the peasant saw how well he ate and drank, his heart desired what he saw and would willingly have been a doctor too. So he remained standing a while, and at length inquired if he too could not be a doctor. "'Oh, yes,' said the doctor, "'that is soon managed.' "'What must I do?' asked the peasant. "'In the first place, buy yourself an ABC book of the kind which has a cock on the frontispiece. "'In the second, turn your cart and your two oxen into money.' and get yourself some clothes and whatsoever else pertains to medicine. Thirdly, have a sign painted for yourself with the words, I am Dr. Nowall, and have that nailed up above your house door. The peasant did everything that he had been told to do. When he had doctored people a while, but not long, a rich and great lord had some money stolen. Then he was told about Dr. Norwell, who lived in such and such a village, and must know what had become of the money. So the Lord had the horses harnessed to his carriage, drove out to the village, and asked Crab if he were Dr. Norwell. Yes, he was, he said. Then he was to go with him and bring back the stolen money. Oh, yes, but Greta, my wife, must go too. The Lord was willing and let both of them have a seat in the carriage, and they all drove away together. When they came to the nobleman's castle, the table was spread, and Crab was told to sit down and eat. Yes, but my wife, Greta, too, said he, and he seated himself with her at the table. And when the first servant came with a dish of delicate fare, the peasant nudged his wife and said, Greta, that was the first meaning that was the servant who brought the first dish. The servant, however, thought he intended by that to say, that is the first thief. And as he actually was so, he was terrified and said to his comrade outside, the doctor knows all, we shall fare ill. He said I was the first. The second did not want to go in at all, but was forced. So when he went in with his dish, the peasant nudged his wife and said, Greta, that is the second. This servant was equally alarmed, and he got out as fast as he could. The third fared no better, for the peasant again said, 
Greta, that is the third. The fourth had to carry in a dish that was covered, and the Lord told the doctor that he was to show his skill and guess what was beneath the cover. Actually, there were crabs. The doctor looked at the dish, had no idea what to say, and cried, Ah, poor crab! When the Lord heard that, he cried, There! He knows it! He must also know who has the money! On this, the servants looked terribly uneasy, and made a sign to the doctor that they wished him to step outside for a moment. When therefore he went out, all four of them confessed to him that they had stolen the money, and said that they would willingly restore it, and give him a heavy sum into the bargain, if he would not denounce them, for if he did, they would be hanged. They led him to the spot where the money was concealed. With this, the doctor was satisfied, and returned to the hall, sat down to the table, and said, My lord, now will I search in my book where the gold is hidden. The fifth servant, however, crept into the stove to hear if the doctor knew still more. But the doctor sat still and opened his ABC book, turned the pages backwards and forwards, and looked for the cock. As he could not find it immediately, he said, I know you are here, so you had better come out. Then the fellow in the stove thought that the doctor meant him, and full of terror, sprung out, crying, That man knows everything. Then Dr. Nowell showed the Lord where the money was, but did not say who had stolen it and received from both sides much money in reward, and became a renowned man. End of Dr. Nowell by the Brothers Grimm Hansel and Gretel by the Grimm Brothers, also known as the Brothers Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel, and the girl Gretel. He had little to bite and to break, and once, when great dearth fell upon the land, he could no longer procure even daily bread. Now, when he thought over this by night in his bed, and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, What is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children, when we no longer have anything even for ourselves? I tell you what, husband, answered the woman, early in the morning we will take the children out to the forest to where it is the thickest. There we will light a fire for them, and give each of them one more piece of bread. And then we will go to our work and leave them alone. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them. No, wife, said the man, I will not do that. How can I bear to leave my children alone in the forest? The wild animals would soon come and tear them to pieces. Oh, you fool! she said. Then we must pass all four die of hunger, and you may as well plane the planks for our coffins. And she left him no peace until he consented. But I feel very sorry for the poor children, all the same, said the man. The two children had also not been able to sleep for hunger, and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitter tears, and said to Hansel, "'Now all is over with us.' "'Be quiet, Gretel,' said Hansel. "'Do not distress yourself. I will soon find a way to help us.' And when the old folks had fallen asleep, he got up, put on his little coat, opened the door below, and crept outside. The moon shone brightly, and the white pebbles which lay in front of the house glittered like real silver pennies. Hansel stooped and stuffed the little pocket of his coat with as many as he could get in. 
Then he went back and said to Gretel, Be comforted, dear little sister, and sleep in peace. God will not forsake us. And he lay down again in his bed. When day dawned, but before the sun had risen, the woman came and awoke the two children, saying, Get up, you sluggards. We're going into the forest to fetch wood. She gave each a little piece of bread and said, There is something for your dinner, but do not eat it up before then, for you won't get nothing else. Gretel took the bread under her apron, as Hansel had the pebbles in his pocket. Then they all set out together on the way to the forest. When they had walked a short time, Hansel stood still and peeped back at the house, and did so again and again. His father said, Hansel, what are you looking at there, and staying behind for? Pay attention, and do not forget how to use your legs. Oh, father, said Hansel, I'm looking at my little white cat, which is sitting up on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me. The wife said, Fool, that is not your little cat. That is a morning sun which is shining on the chimneys. Hansel, however, had not been looking back at the cat, but had been constantly throwing one of the white pebble stones out of his pocket on the road. When they had reached the middle of the forest, the father said, Now, children, pile up some wood, and I will light a fire, that you may not be cold. Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood together as high as a little hill. The brushwood was lighted, and when the flames were burning very high, the woman said, Now, children, lay yourselves down by the fire and rest. We will go into the forest and cut some wood. When we have done, we will come back and fetch you away. Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and when noon came, each ate a little piece of bread, and as they heard the strokes of the wood axe, they believed that their father was near. It was not the axe, however, but a branch which he had fastened to a withered tree, which the wind was blowing backwards and forwards. And as they had been sitting such a long time, their eyes closed with fatigue, and they fell fast asleep. When at last they awoke, it was already dark night. Gretel began to cry, and said, How are we going to get out of the forest now? But Hansel comforted her, and said, Just wait a little, until the moon has risen, and then we will soon find the way. And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand, and followed the pebbles which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the woman opened it, and saw that it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, "'You naughty children!' Why have you slept so long in the forest? We thought you were never coming back at all. The father, however, rejoiced, for it had cut him to the heart to leave them behind alone. Not long afterward there was once more great dearth throughout the land, and the children heard their mother saying at night to their father, Everything is eaten again. We have one half loaf left, and that is the end. The children must go. We will take them farther into the wood, so that they will not find their way out again. There is no other means of saving ourselves. The man's heart was heavy, and he thought, It would be better for you to share the last mouthful with your children. The woman, however, would listen to nothing that he had to say, but scolded and reproached him. He who says A must say B likewise, and as he had yielded the first time, he had to do so a second time also. The children, however, were still awake, and had heard the conversation. When the old folks were asleep, Hansel again got up, and wanted to go out and pick up pebbles as he had done before, but the woman had locked the door, 
and Hansel could not get out. Nevertheless, he comforted his little sister, and said, Do not cry, Gretel. Go to sleep quietly. The good God will help us. Early in the morning came the woman, and took the children out of their beds. Their piece of bread was given to them, but it was still smaller than the time before. On the way into the forest Hansel crumbled his in his pocket, and often stood still and threw a morsel on the ground. "'Hansel, why do you stop and look round?' said the father. "'Go on.' "'I am looking back at my little pigeon, which is sitting on the roof, and wants to say good-bye to me,' answered Hansel. "'Fool!' said the woman. "'That is not your little pigeon. That is a morning sun that's shining on a chimney.' Hansel, however, little by little, threw all the crumbs on the path. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest, where they had never in their lives been before. Then a great fire was made again, and the mother said, "'Just sit there, you children, and when you're tired you must sleep a little. We are going into the forest to cut wood, and in the evening, when we are done, we'll come back and fetch you away.' When it was noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, who had scattered his by the way. Then they fell asleep, and evening passed, but no one came to the poor children. They did not awake until it was dark night, and Hansel comforted his little sister, and said, "'Just wait, Gretel, until the moon rises, and then we shall see the crumbs of bread which I have strewn about. They will show us our way home again. When the moon came, they set out, but they found no crumbs, for the many thousands of birds which fly about in the woods and fields had picked them all up. Hansel said to Gretel, We shall soon find the way. But they did not find it. They walked the whole night, and the next day too, from morning till evening, but they did not get out of the forest, and they were very hungry, for they had nothing to eat but two or three berries, which grew on the ground. And as they were so weary that their legs would carry them no longer, they lay down beneath a tree and fell asleep. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house. They began to walk again, but they always came deeper into the forest, and if help did not come soon, they must die of hunger and weariness. When it was midday, they saw a beautiful snow-white bird sitting on a bough, which sang so delightfully that they stood and listened to it. And when its song was over, it spread its wings and flew away before them. And they followed it until they reached a little house, on the roof of which it alighted, and when they approached the little house, they saw that it was built of bread and covered with cakes, but that the windows were of clear sugar. "'We will set to work on that,' said Hansel, "'and have a good meal. "'I will eat a bit of the roof, and you, Gretel, can eat some of the window. "'It will taste sweet.' Hansel reached up and broke off a little of the roof to try how it tasted, and Gretel leant against the window and nibbled at the panes. Then a soft voice cried from the parlor. Nibble, nibble, gnaw. Who is nibbling at my little house? The children answered, The wind, the wind, the heaven-born wind, and went on eating without disturbing themselves. Hansel, who liked the taste of the roof, tore down a great piece of it, and Gretel pushed out the whole of one round window pane, sat down, and enjoyed herself with it. Suddenly the door opened, and a woman as old as the hills, who supported herself on crutches, came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so terribly frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head and said, "'Oh, you dear children, who has brought you here? Do come in and stay with me.' "'No harm shall happen to you,' 
she took them both by the hand and led them into her little house. Then good food was set before them, milk and pancakes with sugar, apples, and nuts. Afterward, two pretty little beds were covered with clean white linen, and Hansel and Gretel lay down in them and thought they were in heaven. The old woman, who had only pretended to be so kind, she was in reality a wicked witch who lay in wait for children, and had only built a little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked and ate it, and that was a feast day with her. Witches have red eyes and cannot see far, but they have a keen scent, like the beasts, and are aware when human beings draw near. When Hansel and Gretel came into her neighborhood, she laughed with malice and said mockingly, Ha! <laughs> I have them. They shall not escape me again. Early in the morning, before the children were awake, she was already up, and when she saw both of them sleeping and looking so pretty, with their plump and rosy cheeks, she muttered to herself, That will be a dainty mouthful. Then she seized Hansel with her shriveled hand, carried him into a little stable, and locked him in behind a grated door. Scream as he might, it would not help him. Then she went to Gretel, shook her till she awoke, and cried, Get up, lazy thing, fetch some water, and cook something for your brother. He is in the stable outside, and is to be made fat. When he is fat, I will eat him. Gretel began to weep bitterly, but it was all in vain, for she was forced to do what the wicked witch commanded. And now the best food was cooked for poor Hansel, but Gretel got nothing but crab shells. Every morning the woman crept to the little stable and cried, Hansel, stretch out your finger, that I may feel if you will soon be fat. Hansel, however, stretched out a little bone to her, and the old woman, who had dim eyes, could not see it, and thought it was Hansel's finger, and was astonished that there was no way of fattening him. When four weeks had gone by, and Hansel still remained thin, she was seized with impatience, and would not wait any longer. "'Now then, Gretel!' she cried to the girl. Stir yourself and bring some water. Let Hansel be fat or lean. Tomorrow I will kill him and cook him. Ah, oh, how the poor little sister did lament when she had to fetch the water, and how her tears did flow down her cheeks. Dear God, do help us, she cried. If the wild beasts in the forest had but devoured us, we should at any rate have died together. Just keep your noise to yourself, said the old woman. It won't help you at all. Early in the morning, Gretel had to go out and hang up the cauldron with the water and light the fire. We will bake first, said the old woman. I have already heated the oven and kneaded the dough. She pushed poor Gretel out of the oven, from which flames of fire were already darting. Creep in, said the witch, and see if it is properly heated, so that we can put the bread in. And once Gretel was inside, she intended to shut the oven and let her bake in it, and then she would eat her too. But Gretel saw what she had in mind, and said, I do not know how I am to do it. How do I get in? Silly goose, said the woman. The door is big enough. Just look. I can see it. I can get in it myself. And she crept up and thrust her head into the oven. Then Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it, and shut the iron door, and fastened the bolt. Ugh! Oh! Then she began to howl quite horribly, 
but Gretel ran away, and the godless witch was miserably burnt to death. Gretel, however, ran like lightning to Hansel, opened his little stable, and cried, "'Hansel, are we saved? The old witch is dead!' Then Hansel sprang like a bird from its cage when the doors opened. How they did rejoice and embrace each other and dance about and kiss each other! And as they had no longer any need to fear her, they went into the witch's house, and in every corner there stood chests full of pearls and jewels. "'These are far better than the pebbles,' said Hansel, and thrust into his pockets whatever could be got in, and Gretel said, "'I, too, will take something home with me,' and filled her pinafore full. "'But now we must be off,' said Hansel, "'that we may get out of the witch's forest.' When they had walked for two hours, they came to a great stretch of water. "'We cannot cross,' said Hansel. "'I see no foot-plank and no bridge. "'And there is also no ferry,' answered Gretel. "'But a white duck is swimming there. "'If I ask her, she will help us over.' And then she cried, "'Little duck, little duck, douse, douse see. "'Hansel and Gretel are waiting for thee. "'There's never a plank or bridge in sight. "'Take us across on thy back so white.' "'The duck came to them, and Hansel seated himself on its back, "'and told his sister to sit by him. "'No,' replied Gretel, "'that would be too heavy for the little duck. "'She shall take us across one after the other.' "'The little duck did so.' And when they were once safely across, and had walked for a short time, the forest seemed to be more and more familiar to them, and at length they saw from afar their father's house. They began to run, rushed into the parlor, and threw themselves round their father's neck. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left the children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead." Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room, and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them. Then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. My tale is done. There runs a mouse. Whosoever catches it may make himself a big fur cap out of it. End of Hansel and Gretel by the Grimm Brothers, also known as the Brothers Grimm. Read today by Deborah Knight in the state of Illinois, February 5, 2011. The Little Match Seller by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was terribly cold and nearly dark on the last evening of the old year, and the snow was falling fast. In the cold and the darkness, a poor little girl, with bare head and naked feet, roamed through the streets. It is true she had on a pair of slippers when she left home, but they were not of much use. They were very large so large indeed that they had belonged to her mother, and the poor little creature had lost them in running across the street to avoid two carriages that were rolling along at a terrible rate. One of the slippers she could not find, and a boy seized upon the other and ran away with it, saying that he could use it as a cradle when he had children of his own. So the little girl went on with her little naked feet, which were quite red and blue with the cold, in an old apron she carried a number of matches, and had a bundle of them in her hands. No one had bought anything of her the whole day, nor had anyone given her even a penny. Shivering with cold and hunger, she crept along. Poor little child, she looked the picture of misery. Snowflakes fell on her long fair hair, which hung in curls on her shoulders, but she regarded them not. Lights were shining from every window, 
and there was a savory smell of roast goose, for it was New Year's Eve. Yes, she remembered that. In a corner between two houses, one of which projected beyond the other, she sank down and huddled herself together. She had drawn her little feet under her, but she could not keep off the cold, and she dared not go home, for she had sold no matches, and could not take home even a penny of money. Her father would certainly beat her. Besides, it was almost as cold at home as here, for they had only the roof to cover them, through which the wind howled, although the largest holes had been stopped up with straw and rags. Her little hands were almost frozen with the cold. Ah, perhaps a burning match might be some good. If she could draw it from the bundle and strike it against the wall, just to warm her fingers, she drew one out. Tsh, scratch! How it sputtered as it burnt! It gave a warm, bright light, like a little candle, as she held her hand over it. It was really a wonderful light. It seemed to the little girl that she was sitting by a large iron stove with polished brass feet and a brass ornament. How the fire burned! And it seemed so beautifully warm that the child stretched out her feet as if to warm them, when, lo, the flame of the match went out. The stove vanished, and she had only the remains of the half-burnt match in her hand. She rubbed another match on the wall. It burst into a flame, and where its light fell upon the wall, it became as transparent as a veil, and she could see into the room. The table was covered with a snowy white tablecloth, on which stood a splendid dinner service, and a steaming roast goose, stuffed with apples and dried plums. And what was still more wonderful, the goose jumped down from the dish and waddled across the floor, with a knife and fork in its breast, to the little girl. Then the match went out, and there remained nothing but the thick, damp, cold wall before her. She lighted another match, and then she found herself sitting under a beautiful Christmas tree. It was larger and more beautifully decorated than the one which she had seen through the glass door at the rich merchant's. Thousands of tapers were burning upon the green branches, and colored pictures, like those she had seen in the show windows, looked down upon it all. The little one stretched out her hand towards them, and the match went out. The Christmas lights rose higher and higher, till they looked to her like the stars in the sky. Then she saw a star fall, leaving behind it a bright streak of fire. Someone is dying, thought the little girl, for her old grandmother, the only one who had ever loved her, and who was now dead, had told her that when a star falls a soul was going up to God. She again rubbed a match on the wall, and the light shone round her. In the brightness stood her old grandmother, clear and shining, yet mild and loving in her appearance. Grandmother, cried the little one, oh, take me with you. I know you will go away when the match burns out. You will vanish like the warm stove, the roast goose, and the large glorious Christmas tree and she made haste to light the whole bundle of matches, for she wished to keep her grandmother there. And the matches glowed with a light that was brighter than the noonday, and her grandmother had never appeared so large or so beautiful. She took the little girl in her arms, and they both flew upwards in brightness and joy, far above the earth, where there was neither cold, nor hunger, nor pain for they were with God. In the dawn of morning there lay the poor little one, with pale cheeks and smiling mouth, leaning against the wall. She had been frozen to death on the last evening of the year, and the New Year's sun rose and shone upon a little corpse. The child still sat in the stiffness of death, holding the matches in her hand, one bundle of which was burnt. She tried to warm herself, said some. 
No one imagined what beautiful things she had seen, nor into what glory she had entered with her grandmother on New Year's Day. End of the Little Match Seller by Hans Christian Andersen Read today by Deborah Knight in the state of Illinois, February 5th, 2011. The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep, so deep indeed that no cable could sound it, and many church steeples, piled one upon another, would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwelt the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed, for on this sand grow the strangest flowers and plants, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very sensible woman, but exceedingly proud of her high birth, and on that account wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others of high rank were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her six granddaughters. They were beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea. But, like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and the fish swam in, just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the windows. Only the fishes swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers, and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold, and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if the blue sky were everywhere, above and below, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather the sun could be seen, looking like a reddish-purple flower with light streaming from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower-bed in the form of a whale, another preferred to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid, while the youngest child made hers round, like the sun, and in it grew flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful. While her sisters showed delight at the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared only for her pretty flowers, red like the sun, and a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. 
she planted by the statue a rose-colored weeping willow. It grew rapidly and soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadows had the color of violet and waved to and fro like the branches, so that it seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play, trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her it seemed most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land had fragrance, while those below the sea had none, that the trees of the forest were green, and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was a pleasure to listen to them. Her grandmother called the birds fishes, or the little mermaid would not have understood what she meant, for she had never seen birds. "'When you have reached your fifteenth year,' said the grandmother, "'you will have permission to rise up out of the sea "'and sit on the rocks in the moonlight "'while the great ships go sailing by. "'Then you will see both forests and towns. "'In the following year one of the sisters would be fifteen, "'but as each was a year younger than the other, "'the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came "'to rise up from the bottom of the ocean to see the earth as we do. "'However, each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit "'and what she thought was most beautiful. "'Their grandmother could not tell them enough. "'There were so many things about which they wanted to know. "'None of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest. "'She who had the longest time to wait and who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many nights she stood by the open window, looking up through the dark blue water and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails. She could see the moon and stars shining faintly, but through the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed between her and them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head, or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them, holding out her white hands toward the keel of the ship. At length the eldest was fifteen and was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean. When she returned, she had hundreds of things to talk about. But the finest thing, she said, was to lie on a sand bank in the quiet moonlit sea, near the shore, gazing at the lights of the nearby town, that twinkled like hundreds of stars, and listening to the sounds of music, the noise of carriages, the voices of human beings, and the merry pealing of the bells in the church steeples. Because she could not go near all these wonderful things, she longed for them all the more. Oh, how eagerly did the youngest sister listen to all these descriptions! And afterwards, when she stood at the open window, looking up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city, with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. In another year the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water and to swim about where she pleased. She rose just as the sun was setting, and this, she said, was the most beautiful sight of all. The whole sky looked like gold, and violet and rose-colored clouds, which she could not describe, drifted across it. And more swiftly than the clouds flew a large flock of wild swans toward the setting sun, like a long white veil across the sea. She also swam towards the sun, but it sank into the waves, and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea. The third sister's turn followed, and she was the boldest of them all, for she swam up a broad river that emptied into the sea. On the banks she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines, and palaces and castles peeping out from amid the proud trees of the forest. She heard birds singing, and felt the rays of the sun so strongly that she was obliged often to dive under the water to cool her burning face. In a narrow creek she found a large group of little human children, 
almost naked, sporting about in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they fled in a great fright, and then a little black animal, it was a dog, but she did not know it, for she had never seen one before, came to the water and barked at her so furiously that she became frightened and rushed back to the open sea. But she said she should never forget the beautiful forest, the green hills, and the pretty children who could swim in the water although they had no tails. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but said it was quite as beautiful there as nearer the land. She could see many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls. The dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils, till it seemed as if a hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her turn came, she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were of the most singular shapes and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself on one of the largest, and let the wind play with her long hair. She noticed that all the ships sailed past very rapidly, steering as far away as they could, as if they were afraid of the iceberg. Toward evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky, the thunder rolled, and the flashes of lightning glowed red on the icebergs as they were tossed about by the heaving sea. On all the ships the sails were reefed with fear and trembling, while she sat on the floating iceberg, calmly watching the lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. Each of the sisters, when first she had permission to rise to the surface, was delighted with the new and beautiful sights. Now that they were grown-up girls and could go when they pleased, they had become quite indifferent about it. They soon wished themselves back again, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms about each other and rise to the surface again. Their voices were more charming than that of any human being, and before the approach of a storm, when they feared that a ship might be lost, they swam before the vessel, singing enchanting songs of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea, and begging the voyagers not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song, and thought it was the sighing of the storm. These things were never beautiful to them, for if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. When the sisters rose, arm in arm, through the water, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only, since mermaids have no tears, she suffered more acutely. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, she said, I know that I shall love the world up there and all the people who live in it. At last she reached her fifteenth year. Well, now you are grown up, said the old dogger, her grandmother. Come and let me adorn you like your sisters. And she placed in her hair a wreath of white lilies, of which every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. "'But they hurt me so,' said the little mermaid. "'Yes, I know. Pride must suffer pain,' replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better.' but she could not change herself, so she said farewell and rose as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. The sun had just set when she raised her head above the waves. The clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, 
and through the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty. The sea was calm, and the air mild and fresh. A large ship with three masts lay becalmed on the water. Only one sail was set, for not a breeze stirred, and the sailor sat idle on deck or amidst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on, a hundred colored lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The little mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then, as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through glass window panes and see a number of gaily dressed people. Among them, and the most beautiful of all, was a young prince with large black eyes. He was sixteen years of age, and his birthday was being celebrated with great display. The sailors were dancing on the deck, and when the prince came out of the cabin, more than a hundred rockets rose in the air, making it as bright as day. The little mermaid was so startled that she dived under water, and when she again stretched out her head, it looked as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her. She had never seen such fireworks before. Great suns spurted fire about, splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. The ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people, and even the smallest rope, could be distinctly seen. How handsome the young prince looked, as he pressed the hands of all his guests and smiled at them, while the music resounded through the clear night air. It was very late, yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns had been extinguished, no more rockets rose in the air, and the cannon had ceased firing. But the sea became restless, and a moaning, grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves. Still the little mermaid remained by the cabin window, rocking up and down on the water, so that she could look within. After a while the sails were quickly set, and the ship went on her way. But soon the waves rose higher, heavy clouds darkened the sky, and lightning appeared in the distance. A dreadful storm was approaching. Once more the sails were furled, and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea. The waves rose mountain-high as if they would overtop the mast, but the ship dived like a swan between them, then rose again on their lofty foaming crests. To the little mermaid this was pleasant sport, but not so to the sailors. At length the ship groaned and creaked. The thick planks gave way under the lashing of the sea. As the waves broke over the deck, the main mast snapped asunder like a reed, and as the ship lay over on her side, the water rushed in. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger. Even she was obliged to be careful, to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck which lay scattered on the water. At one moment it was pitch dark, so that she could not see a single object, but when a flash of lightning came it revealed the whole scene. She could see every one who had been on board except the prince. When the ship parted she had seen him sink into the deep waves, and she was glad, for she thought he would now be with her. Then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water, so that when he got down to her father's palace he would certainly be quite dead. No, he must not die. So she swam about among the beams and planks which strewed the surface of the sea, forgetting that they could crush her to pieces. Diving deep under the dark waters, rising and falling with the waves, she at length managed to reach the young prince, who was fast losing the power to swim in that stormy sea. His limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water and let the waves carry them where they would. In the morning the storm had ceased, but of the ship not a single fragment could be seen. The sun came up red and shining out of the water, and its beams brought back the hue of health to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes remained closed. 
the mermaid kissed his high, smooth forehead and stroked back his wet hair. He seemed to her like the marble statue in her little garden, so she kissed him again and wished that he might live. Presently they came in sight of land, and she saw lofty blue mountains on which the white snow rested, as if a flock of swans were lying upon them. Beautiful green forests were near the shore, and close by stood a large building, whether a church or a convent she could not tell. Orange and citron trees grew in the garden, and before the door stood lofty palms. The sea here formed a little bay, in which the water lay quiet and still, but very deep. She swam with the handsome prince to the beach, which was covered with fine white sand, and there she laid him in the warm sunshine, taking care to raise his head higher than his body. The bells sounded in the large white building, and some young girls came into the garden. The little mermaid swam out farther from the shore, and hid herself among some high rocks that rose out of the water. Covering her head and neck with the foam of the sea, she watched there to see what would become of the poor prince. It was not long before she saw a young girl approach the spot where the prince lay. She seemed frightened at first, but only for a moment. Then she brought a number of people, and the mermaid saw that the prince came to life again, and smiled upon those who stood about him. But to her he sent no smile. He knew not that she had saved him. This made her very sorrowful, and when he was led away into the great building, she dived down into the water and returned to her father's castle. She had always been silent and thoughtful, and now she was more so than ever. Her sisters asked her what she had seen during her first visit to the surface of the water, but she could tell them nothing. Many an evening and morning did she rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruits in the garden ripen, and watched them gathered. She watched the snow on the mountain tops melt away, but never did she see the prince, and therefore she always returned home more sorrowful than before. It was her only comfort to sit in her own little garden and fling her arm around the beautiful marble statue, which was like the prince. She gave up tending her flowers, and they grew in wild confusion over the paths, twining their long leaves and stems round the branches of the trees, so that the whole place became dark and gloomy. At length she could bear it no longer, and told one of her sisters all about it. Then the others heard the secret, and very soon it became known to several mermaids, one of whom had an intimate friend who happened to know about the prince. She had also seen the festival on board ship, and she told them where the prince came from and where his palace stood. "'Come, little sister,' said the other princesses. Then they intertwined their arms and rose together to the surface of the water, near the spot where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of bright yellow, shining stone, and had long flights of marble steps, one of which reached quite down to the sea." Splendid gilded cupolas rose over the roof, and between the pillars that surrounded the whole building stood lifelike statues of marble. Through the clear crystal of the lofty windows could be seen noble rooms, with costly silk curtains and hangings of tapestry, and walls covered with beautiful paintings. In the center of the largest salon, a fountain threw its sparkling jets high up into the glass cupola of the ceiling, through which the sun shone in upon the water and upon the beautiful plants that grew in the basin of the fountain. Now that the little mermaid knew where the prince lived, she spent many an evening and many a night on the water near the palace. She would swim much nearer the shore than any of the others had ventured, and once she went up the narrow channel under the marble balcony, which threw a broad shadow on the water. Here she sat and watched the young prince, who thought himself alone in the bright moonlight. She often saw him evenings, sailing in a beautiful boat, on which music sounded and flags waved. She peeped out from among the green rushes, 
and if the wind caught her long silvery white veil, those who saw it believed it to be a swan, spreading out its wings. Many a night, too, when the fishermen set their nets by the light of their torches, she heard them relate many good things about the young prince. And this made her glad that she had saved his life when he was tossed about half dead on the waves. She remembered how his head had rested on her bosom, and how heartily she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of all this, and could not even dream of her. She grew more and more to like human beings, and wished more and more to be able to wander about with those whose world seemed to be so much larger than her own. They could fly over the sea in ships, and mount the high hills which were far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed, their woods and their fields, stretched far away beyond the reach of her sight. There was so much that she wished to know. But her sisters were, were unable to answer all her questions. She then went to her old grandmother, who knew all about the upper world, which she rightly called the lands above the sea. "'If human beings are not drowned,' asked the little mermaid, "'can they live for ever? "'Do they never die, as we do here in the sea?' "'Yes,' replied the old lady. "'They must also die, and their term of life is even shorter than ours. "'We sometimes live for three hundred years, "'but when we cease to exist here, "'we become only foam on the surface of the water, "'and have not even a grave among those we love.' We have not immortal souls, we shall never live again. Like the green seaweed, when once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have souls which live forever, even after the body has been turned to dust. They rise up through the clear, pure air beyond the glittering stars. As we rise out of the water and behold all the land of the earth, so do they rise to unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. "'Why have we not immortal souls?' asked the little mermaid mournfully. "'I would gladly give all the hundreds of years that I have to live to be a human being only for one day, and to have the hope of knowing the happiness of that glorious world above the stars.' "'You must not think that, said the old woman. We believe that we are much happier and much better off than human beings. So I shall die, said the little mermaid, and as the foam of the sea I shall be driven about, never again to hear the music of the waves or to see the pretty flowers or the red sun. Is there anything I can do to win an immortal soul? No, said the old woman, unless a man should love you so much that you were more to him than his father or his mother, and if all his thoughts and all his love were fixed upon you, and the priest placed his right hand in yours, and he promised to be true to you, here and hereafter, then his soul would glide into your body, and you would obtain a share in the future happiness of mankind. He would give to you a soul and retain his own as well. But this can never happen." Your fish's tail, which among us is considered so beautiful, on earth is thought to be quite ugly. They do not know any better, and they think it necessary, in order to be handsome, to have two stout props, which they call legs. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sorrowfully at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the old lady, and dart and spring about during the three hundred years that we have to live, which is really quite long enough. After that we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening we are going to have a court ball. It was one of those splendid sights which we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were of thick but transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells, some of a deep red, others of a grass green, with blue fire in them, stood in rows on each side. These lighted up the whole salon, and shone through the walls so that the sea was also illuminated. Innumerable fishes, great and small, 
swam past the crystal walls. On some of them the scales glowed with a purple brilliance, and on others shone like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and in it danced the mermen and the mermaids to the music of their own sweet singing. No one on earth has such lovely voices as they, but the little mermaid sang more sweetly than all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the sweetest voice either on earth or in the sea. But soon she thought again of the world above her. She could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. She crept away silently out of her father's palace, and while everything within was gladness and song, she sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water, and thought, He is certainly sailing above. He in whom my wishes center, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid. She can give me counsel and help. Then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took to the road to the foaming whirlpools, behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before. Neither flowers nor grass grew there. Nothing but bare, gray, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water, like foaming mill wheels, seized everything that came within its reach, and cast it into the fathomless deep. Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools the little mermaid was obliged to pass, before she could reach the dominions of the sea witch. Then, for a long distance, the road lay across a stretch of warm, bubbling mire, called by the witch her turf moor. Beyond this was the witch's house, which stood in the center of a strange forest where all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animal and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea they seized upon and held fast so that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still and her heart beat with fear. She came very near turning back, but she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long flowing hair round her head, so that the polypi should not lay hold of it. She crossed her hands on her bosom, and then darted forward as a fish shoots through the water, between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly pulpi, which were stretched out on each side of her. She saw that they all held in their grasp something they had seized with their numerous little arms, which were as strong as iron bands. Tightly grasped in their clinging arms were white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and had sunk down into the deep waters skeletons of land animals, and oars, rudders, and chests of ships. There was even a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled, and this seemed the most shocking of all to the little princess. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where large fat water snakes were rolling in the mire, and showing their ugly drab-colored bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house, built of the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as people sometimes feed a canary with pieces of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens, and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom. "'I know what you want,' said the sea witch. "'It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way.' though it will bring you to sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail, and to have two supports instead, like human beings on the earth, 
so that the young prince may fall in love with you, and so that you may have an immortal soul. And then the witch laughed so loud and so disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling. "'You are but just in time,' said the witch, "'for after sunrise to-morrow I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a draft for you, with which you must swim to land to-morrow before sunrise. Seat yourself there and drink it. Your tail will then disappear and shrink up into what men call legs.' You will feel great pain, as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement, and no dancer will ever tread so lightly. Every step you take, however will be as if you were treading upon sharp knives, and as if the blood must flow. If you will bear all this, I will help you. Yes, I will, said the little princess, in a trembling voice, as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But think again, said the witch, for when once your shape has become like a human being, you can no more be a mermaid. You will never return through the water to your sister's or to your father's palace again. And if you do not win the love of the prince, so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake, and to love you with his whole soul and allow the priest to join your hands that you may be man and wife, then you will never have an immortal soul. The first morning after he marries another, your heart will break, and you will become foam on the crest of the waves. I will do it, said the little mermaid, and she became pale as death. But I must be paid also, said the witch, and it is not a trifle that I ask. You have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea, and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it. But this voice you must give to me. The best thing you possess will I have as the price of my costly draft, which must be mixed with my own blood, so that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword." "'But if you take away my voice,' said the little mermaid, "'what is left for me? "'Your beautiful form, your graceful walk, "'and your expressive eyes. "'Surely with these you can enchain a man's heart. "'Well, have you lost your courage? "'Put out your little tongue, "'that I may cut it off as my payment. "'Then you shall have the powerful draft. "'It shall be.' said the little mermaid. Then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught. Cleanliness is a good thing, said she, scouring the vessel with snakes which she had tied together in a large knot. Then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into the cauldron. The steam that rose twisted itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look at them without fear. Every moment the witch threw a new ingredient into the vessel, and when it began to boil, the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile. When at last the magic draft was ready, it looked like the clearest water. "'There it is for you,' said the witch." Then she cut off the mermaid's tongue, so that she would never again speak or sing. "'If the Palape should seize you as you return through the wood,' said the witch, "'throw over them a few drops of the potion, and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces.' But the little mermaid had no occasion to do this, for the Palapai sprang back in terror, 
when they caught sight of the glittering draft which shone in her hand like a twinkling star. So she passed quickly through the wood and the marsh and between the rushing whirlpools. She saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished, and that all within were asleep. But she did not venture to go into them, for now that she was dumb and going to leave them forever, she felt as if her heart would break. She stole into the garden, took a flower from the flower-bed of each of her sisters, kissed her hand towards the palace a thousand times, and then rose up through the dark blue waters. The sun had not risen when she came in sight of the prince's palace, and approached the beautiful marble steps, but the moon shone clear and bright. Then the little mermaid drank the magic draught, and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went through her delicate body, she fell into a swoon and lay like one dead. When the sun rose and shone over the sea, she recovered and felt a sharp pain, but before her stood the handsome young prince. He fixed his coal-black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own and then became aware that her fish's tail was gone, and that she had as pretty a pair of white legs and tiny feet as any little maiden could have. But she had no clothes, so she wrapped herself in her long, thick hair. The prince asked her who she was and whence she came. She looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes, but could not speak. He took her by the hand and led her to the palace. Every step she took was as the witch had said it would be. She felt as if she were treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives. She bore it willingly, however, and moved at the prince's side as lightly as a bubble, so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements. She was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin, and was the most beautiful creature in the palace but she was dumb and could neither speak nor sing. Beautiful female slaves, dressed in silk and gold, stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang better than all the others, and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. This was a great sorrow to the little mermaid, for she knew how much more sweetly she herself once could sing, and she thought, Oh! if he could only know that I have given away my voice for ever to be with him. The slaves next performed some pretty fairy-like dances, to the sound of beautiful music. Then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, glided over the floor, and danced as no one yet had been able to dance. At each movement her beauty was more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Every one was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling. She danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor it seemed as if she trod on sharp knives. The prince said she should remain with him always, and she was given permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her, that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet-scented woods, where the green boughs touched their shoulders, and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed with him to the tops of high mountains, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, she only smiled, and followed him till they could see the clouds beneath them like a flock of birds flying to distant lands. While at the prince's palace, and when all the household were asleep, she would go and sit on the broad marble steps, for it eased her burning feet to bathe them in the cold sea water. It was then that she thought of all those below in the deep. Once, during the night, her sisters came up arm in arm, singing sorrowfully as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and they recognized her, and told her how she had grieved them. After that they came to the same place every night. Once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, 
who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and the old sea king, her father, with his crown on his head. They stretched out their hands toward her, but did not venture so near the land as her sisters had. As the days passed, she loved the prince more dearly, and he loved her as one would love a little child. The thought never came to him to make her his wife. Yet, unless he married her, she could not receive an immortal soul, and on the morning, after his marriage with another, she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. "'Do you not love me the best of them all?' the eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say, when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. "'Yes, you are dear to me,' said the prince." "'for you have the best heart, and you are the most devoted to me. "'You are like a young maiden whom I once saw, "'but whom I shall never meet again. "'I was in a ship that was wrecked, "'and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple "'where several young maidens performed the service. "'The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. "'I saw her but twice, "'and she is the only one in the world whom I could love.' "'but you are like her, and you have almost driven her image from my mind. "'She belongs to the holy temple, and good fortune has sent you to me in her stead. "'We will never part. "'Ah, he knows not that it was I who saved his life,' thought the little mermaid. "'I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. "'I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him.' I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me. The mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not weep. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple, therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more. I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him and love him and give up my life for his sake. Very soon it was said that the prince was to marry, and that the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he intended merely to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he went to court the princess. A great company were to go with him. The little mermaid smiled and shook her head. She knew the prince's thoughts better than any of the others. "'I must travel,' he said to her. I must see this beautiful princess. My parents desire it, but they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her, because she is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would choose you, my dumb foundling, with those expressive eyes. Then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long waving hair, and laid his head on her heart, while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. "'You are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child, are you?' he said, and they stood on the deck of the noble ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. Then he told her of storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the deep beneath them, and of what the divers had seen there. She smiled at his descriptions, for she knew better than any one what wonders were at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlight night, when all on board were asleep except the man at the helm, she sat on deck, gazing down through the clear water. She thought she could distinguish her father's castle, and upon it her aged grandmother, with a silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves and gazed at her mournfully wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them and smiled, and wanted to tell them how happy and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached, and when her sisters dived down, he thought what he saw was only the foam of the sea. The next morning the ship sailed into the harbor of a beautiful town belonging to the king, whom the prince was going to visit. The church bells were ringing, and from the high towers sounded a flourish of trumpets. Soldiers with flying colors and glittering bayonets lined the roads through which they passed. Every day was a festival, balls and entertainments following one another. But the princess had not yet appeared.
People said that she had been brought up and educated in a religious house, where she was learning every royal virtue. At last she came. Then the little mermaid, who was anxious to see whether she was really beautiful, was obliged to admit that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty. Her skin was delicately fair, and beneath her long dark eyelashes her laughing blue eyes shone with truth and purity. "'It was you,' said the prince, "'who saved my life, when I lay as if dead on the beach.' And he folded his blushing bride in his arms. "'Oh, I am too happy!' said he to the little mermaid, my fondest hopes are now fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for your devotion to me is great and sincere. The little mermaid kissed his hand, and felt as if her heart were already broken. His wedding morning would bring death to her, and she would change into the foam of the sea. All the church bells rang, and the heralds rode through the town, proclaiming the betrothal. Perfumed oil was burned in costly silver lamps on every altar. The priests waved the censers, while the bride and the bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessing of the bishop. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, held up the bride's train, but her ears heard nothing of the festive music, and her eyes saw not the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of death which was coming to her, and of all she had lost in the world. On the same evening the bride and bridegroom went on board the ship. Cannons were roaring, flags waving, and in the center of the ship a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected. It contained elegant sleeping couches for the bridal pair during the night. The ship, under a favorable wind, with swelling sails, glided away smoothly and lightly over the calm sea. When it grew dark, a number of colored lamps were lighted, and the sailors danced merrily on the deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of the sea, when she had seen similar joyful festivities, so she too joined in the dance, poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey, and all present cheered her wonderingly. She had never danced so gracefully before. Her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives, but she cared not for the pain. A sharper pang had pierced her heart. She knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home. She had given up her beautiful voice and suffered unheard of pain daily for him, while he knew nothing of it. This was the last evening that she should breathe the same air with him, or gaze on the starry sky in the deep sea. An eternal night, without a thought or a dream, awaited her. She had no soul, and now could never win one. All was joy and gaiety on the ship until long after midnight. She smiled and danced with the rest, while the thought of death was in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride, and she played with his raven hair, till they went arm in arm to rest in a sumptuous tent. Then all became still on board the ship, and only the pilot, who stood at the helm, was awake. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel, and looked toward the east for the first blush of morning, for that first ray of the dawn which was to be her death. She saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were as pale as she, but their beautiful hair no longer waved in the wind. It had been cut off. "'We have given our hair to the witch,' they said, "'to obtain help for you, that you may not die to-night. She has given us a knife. See? It is very sharp. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again into a fish's tail, and you will once more be a mermaid and can return to us to live out your three hundred years before you are changed into the salt sea foam. Haste, then, either he or you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother mourns so for you that her white hair is falling, as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back. Hasten! 
"'Do you not see the first red streaks in the sky? "'In a few minutes the sun will rise, and you must die.' Then they sighed deeply and mournfully, and sank beneath the waves. The little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent, and beheld the fair bride, whose head was resting on the prince's breast. She bent down and kissed his noble brow, then looked at the sky on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter. She glanced at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes on the prince, who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams. She was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the hand of the little mermaid, but she flung it far from her into the waves. The water turned red where it fell, and the drops that spurted up looked like blood. She cast one more lingering, half-feigning glance at the prince, then threw herself from the ship into the sea, and felt her body dissolving into foam. The sun rose above the waves, and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid, who did not feel as if she were dying. She saw the bright sun and hundreds of transparent beautiful creatures floating around her. She could see through them the white sails of the ships and the red clouds in the sky. Their speech was melodious, but could not be heard by mortal ears just as their bodies could not be seen by mortal eyes. The little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs, and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam. "'Where am I?' asked she, and her voice sounded ethereal, like the voices of those who were with her. No earthly music could imitate it. "'Among the daughters of the air,' answered one of them. "'A mermaid has not an immortal soul, nor can she obtain one unless she wins the love of a human being. On the will of another hangs her eternal destiny. But the daughters of the air, although they do not possess an immortal soul, can, by their good deeds, procure one for themselves. We fly to warm countries and cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with the pestilence. We carry the perfume of the flowers to spread health and restoration." After we have striven for three hundred years to do all the good in our power, we receive an immortal soul, and take part in the happiness of mankind. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing. You have suffered and endured, and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds, and now, by striving for three hundred years in the same way, you may obtain an immortal soul." The little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes toward the sun, and, for the first time, felt them filling with tears. On the ship in which she had left the prince there were life and noise, and she saw him and his beautiful bride searching for her. Sorrowfully they gazed at the pearly foam, as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen she kissed the forehead of the bride and fanned the prince and then mounted with the other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated above. After three hundred years, thus shall we float into the kingdom of heaven, said she. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one of her companions. Unseen we can enter the houses of men where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child that is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know, when we fly through the room, that we smile with joy at his good conduct, for we can count one year less of our three hundred years. But when we see a naughty or a wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow, and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial. End of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen Read today by Deborah Knight in the state of Illinois, February 6, 2011. The Money Box by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Money Box In a nursery where a number of toys lay scattered about, a money box stood on the top of a very high wardrobe. It was made of clay in the shape of a pig, and had been bought of the potter. In the back of the pig was a slit, and this slit had been enlarged with a knife so that dollars or crown pieces might slip through, and, indeed, there were two in the box, besides a number of pence. The money pig was stuffed so full that it could no longer rattle, which is the highest state of perfection to which a money pig can attain. There he stood upon the cupboard, high and lofty, looking down upon everything else in the room. He knew very well that he had enough inside him to buy up all the other toys, and this gave him a very good opinion of his own value. The rest thought of this fact also, although they did not express it, for there were so many other things to talk about. A large doll, still handsome, though rather old, for her neck had been mended, lay inside one of the drawers which was partly open. She called out to the others, let us have a game at being men and women. That is something worth playing at. Upon this there was a great uproar. Even the engravings, which hung in frames on the wall, turned round in their excitement and showed that they had a wrong side to them, although they had not the least intention to expose themselves in this way or to object to the game. It was late at night, but as the moon shone through the windows, they had light at a cheap rate. And as the game was now to begin, all were invited to take part in it, even the children's wagon, which certainly belonged to the coarser playthings. Each has its own value, said the wagon. We cannot all be noblemen. There must be some to do the work. The money pig was the only one who received a written invitation. He stood so high that they were afraid he would not accept a verbal message. But in his reply, he said if he had to take a part, he must enjoy the sport from his own home. They were to arrange for him to do so, and so they did. The little toy theater was therefore put up in such a way that the money pig could look directly into it. Some wanted to begin with a comedy and afterwards to have a tea party and a discussion for mental improvement, but they commenced with the latter first. The rocking horse spoke of training and races, the wagon of railways and steam power for these subjects belonged to each of their professions, and it was right they should talk of them. The clock talked politics. Tick, tick. He professed to know what was the time of day, but there was a whisper that he did not go correctly. The bamboo cane stood by, looking stiff and proud. He was vain of his brass, furrel and silver top, and on the sofa lay two worked cushions, pretty but stupid. When the play at the little theater began, the rest sat and looked on. They were requested to applaud and stamp or crack when they felt gratified with what they saw. But the riding whip said he never cracked for old people, only for the young who were not yet married. I crack for everybody, said the cracker. Yes, and a fine noise you make, thought the audience, as the play went on. It was not worth much, but it was very well played, and all the characters turned their painted sides to the audience, for they were made only to be seen on one side. 
The acting was wonderful, excepting that sometimes they came out beyond the lamps because the wires were a little too long. The doll, whose neck had been darned, was so excited that the place in her neck burst, and the money pig declared he must do something for one of the players, as they had all pleased him so much. So he made up his mind to remember one of them in his will, as the one to be buried with him in the family vault, whenever that event should happen. They all enjoyed the comedy so much that they gave up all thought of the tea party and only carried out their idea of intellectual amusement, which they called plain at men and women, and there was nothing wrong about it, for it was only play. All the while, each one thought most of himself or of what the money pig could be thinking. His thoughts were on, as he supposed, a very distant time of making his will and of his burial and of when it might all come to pass, certainly sooner than he expected. For all at once, down he came from the top of the press, fell on the ground, and was broken to pieces. Then the pennies hopped and danced about in the most amusing manner. The little ones twirled round like tops, and the large ones rolled away as far as they could, especially the one great silver crown piece, who had often to go out into the world, and now he had his wish as well as the rest of the money. The pieces of the money pig were thrown into the dustbin, and the next day there stood a new money pig on the cupboard, but it had not a farthing in its inside yet, and therefore, like the old one, it could not rattle. This was the beginning with him, and we will make it the end of our story. End of the Money Box by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Jill Preston Mother Holly, also known as Mother Hulda, by the Grimm Brothers, also known as the Brothers Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, there was a widow who had two daughters. One of them was beautiful and industrious, the other ugly and lazy. The mother, however, loved the ugly and lazy one best, because she was her own daughter, and so the other, who was only her stepdaughter, was made to do all the work of the house, and was quite the Cinderella of the family. Her stepmother sent her out every day, to sit by the well in the high road, there to spin until she made her fingers bleed. Now it chanced one day that some blood fell on to the spindle, and as the girl stopped over the well to wash it off, the spindle suddenly sprang out of her hand and fell into the well. She ran home, crying to tell of her misfortune, but her stepmother spoke harshly to her, and after giving her a violent scolding, said unkindly as you have let the spindle fall into the well you may go yourself and fetch it out the girl went back to the well not knowing what to do and at last in her distress she jumped into the water after the spindle she remembered nothing more until she woke and found herself in a beautiful meadow full of sunshine and with countless flowers blooming in every direction. She walked over the meadow, and presently she came upon a baker's oven full of bread, and the loaves cried out to her, Take us out, take us out, or alas, we shall be burnt to a cinder. We were baked through long ago. So she took the bread shovel and drew them all out. She went on a little further, till she came to a tree full of apples. 
"'Shake me, shake me, I pray,' cried the tree. "'My apples, one and all, are ripe.' So she shook the tree, and the apples came falling down upon her like rain. But she continued shaking until there was not a single apple left upon it. Then she carefully gathered the apples together in a heap and walked on again. The next thing she came to was a little house, and there she saw an old woman looking out with such large teeth that she was terrified and turned to run away. But the old woman called after her, "'What are you afraid of, dear child? Stay with me. If you will do the work of my house properly for me, I will make you very happy. You must be very careful, however, to make my bed in the right way, for I wish you always to shake it thoroughly, so that the feathers fly about. Then they say, down there in the world, that it is snowing, for I am Mother Holly. The woman spoke so kindly that the girl summoned up courage and agreed to enter into her service. She took care to do everything according to the old woman's bidding, and every time she made the bed she shook it with all her might, so that the feathers flew about like so many snowflakes. The old woman was as good as her word. She never spoke angrily to her, and gave her roast and boiled meats every day. So she stayed on with Mother Holly for some time, and then she began to grow unhappy. She could not at first tell why she felt sad, but she became conscious at the last of great longing to go home. Then she knew she was homesick, although she was a thousand times better off with Mother Holly than with her mother and sister. After waiting a while, she went to Mother Holly and said, I am so homesick that I cannot stay with you any longer, for although I am so happy here, I must return to my own people. Then Mother Holly said, I am pleased that you should want to go back to your own people, and as you have served me so well and faithfully, I will take you home myself. Thereupon she led the girl by the hand up to a broad gateway. The gate was opened, and the girl passed through. A shower of gold fell upon her, and the gold clung to her so that she was covered with it from head to foot. "'This is a reward for your industry,' said Mother Holly, and as she spoke she handed her the spindle which she had dropped into the well. The gate was then closed, and the girl found herself back in the old world, close to her mother's house. As she entered the courtyard, the cock, who was perched on the well, called out, Cock-a-doodle-doo! Your golden daughters come back to you. Then she went to her mother and sister, and as she was so richly covered with gold, they gave her a warm welcome. She related to them all that had happened, and when the mother heard how she had come by her great riches, she thought she should like her ugly, lazy daughter to go and try her fortune. So she made the sister go and sit by the well and spin, and the girl pricked her finger and thrust her hand into a thorn bush, so that she might drop some blood on to the spindle. Then she threw it into the well and jumped in herself. Like her sister, she awoke in the beautiful meadow and walked over it till she came to the oven. "'Take us out! Take us out, or alas! We shall be burnt to a cinder! We were baked through long ago!' cried the loaves, as before. But the lazy girl answered, "'Do you think I am going to dirty my hands for you?' and walked on. Presently she came to the apple tree. "'Shake me, shake me, I pray! My apples, one and all, are ripe!' it cried. But she only answered, "'A nice thing to ask me to do! One of the apples might fall on my head!' and passed on. At last she came to Mother Holly's house, and as she had heard all about the large teeth from her sister, she was not afraid of them, and engaged herself with delay to the old woman. The first day she was very obedient and industrious, and exerted herself to please Mother Holly, for she thought of the gold she should get in return. 
The next day, however, she began to dawdle over her work, and the third day she was more idle still. Then she began to lie in bed in the mornings and refused to get up. Worse still, she neglected to make the old woman's bed properly, and forgot to shake it so that the feathers might fly about. So Mother Holly very soon got tired of her, and told her she might go. The lazy girl was delighted at this, and thought to herself, The gold will soon be mine. Mother Holly led her, as she had led her sister, to the broad gateway, but as she was passing through, instead of the shower of gold, a great bucket full of pitch came pouring over her. "'That is in return for your services,' said the old woman, and she shut the gate. So the lazy girl had to go home covered with pitch, and the cock on the wall called out as he saw her. Your dirty daughters come back to you. But, try as she would, she could not get the pitch off, and it stuck to her as long as she lived. End of Mother Holly By the Grimm Brothers, also known as the Brothers Grimm. Recorded today by Deborah Knight, February 6th, 2011. On the Way to the Sun by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Way to the Sun. He had journeyed a long way and was very tired. It seemed like a dream when he stood up after a sleep in the field and looked over the wall and saw the garden and the flowers and the children playing all about he looked at the long road behind him at the dark wood and the barren hills it was the world to which he belonged he looked at the garden before him at the big house and the terrace and the steps that led down to the smooth lawn it was the world which belonged to the children "'Poor boy,' said the elder child. "'I will get you something to eat.' "'But where did he come from?' the gardener asked. "'We do not know,' the child answered. "'But he is very hungry, and mother says we may give him some food.' "'I will take him some milk,' said the little one. "'In one hand she carried a mug, and with the other she pulled along her little broken cart.' "'But what is he called?' asked the gardener. "'We do not know,' the little one answered. "'But he is very thirsty, and mother says we may give him some milk.' "'Where is he going?' asked the gardener. "'We do not know,' the children said. "'But he is very tired.' "'When the boy had rested, well, he got up saying, "'I must not stay any longer.' and turned to go on his way. "'What have you to do?' the children asked. "'I am one of the crew and must help to make the world go round,' he answered. "'Why, do we not help too?' "'You are the passengers.' "'How far have you to go?' they asked. "'Oh, a long way,' he answered. "'On and on until I can touch the sun.' "'Will you really touch it?' they said, awestruck. "'I dare say I shall tire long before I get there,' he answered sadly. "'Perhaps without knowing it, though, I shall reach it in my sleep,' he added. But they hardly heard the last words, for he was already far off. "'Why did you talk to him?' the gardener said. He is just a working boy. And we do nothing. It was very good of him to notice us, 
they said humbly. Good, said the gardener in despair. Why, between you and him, there is a great difference. There was only a wall, they answered. Who set it up? they asked curiously. Why, the builders, of course. Men set it up. And who will pull it down? It will not want any pulling down, the man answered grimly. Time will do that. As the children went back to their play, they looked up at the lights towards which the boy was journeying. Perhaps we too shall reach it some day, they said. End of On the Way to the Sun by Mrs. W. K. Clifford Read by Jill Preston The Proud Boy by Mrs. W. K. Clifford This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Proud Boy There was once a very proud boy. He always walked through the village with his eyes turned down and his hands in his pocket. The boys used to stare at him and say nothing, and when he was out of sight, they breathed freely. So the proud boy was lonely and would have had no friends out of doors if it had not been for two stray dogs, the green trees, and a flock of geese upon the common. One day, just by the weaver's cottage, he met the tailor's son. Now the tailor's son made more noise than any other boy in the village, and when he had done anything wrong, he stuck to it and said he didn't care. So the neighbors thought that he was very brave and would do wonders when he came to be a man, and some of them hoped he would be a great traveler and stay long in distant lands. When the tailor's son saw the proud boy, he danced in front of him and made faces and provoked him sorely until, at last, the proud boy turned round and suddenly boxed the ears of the tailor's son and threw his hat into the road. The tailor's son was surprised and, without waiting to pick up his hat, ran away and sitting down in the carpenter's yard cried bitterly. After a few minutes, the proud boy came to him and returned him his hat, saying politely, There is no dust on it. You deserve to have your ears boxed, but I am sorry I was so rude as to throw your hat onto the road. I thought you were proud, said the tailor's son, astonished. I didn't think you'd say that. I wouldn't. Perhaps you are not proud. No, I am not. Ah, that makes a difference, said the proud boy, still more politely. When you are proud and have done a foolish thing, you make a point of owning it. But it takes a lot of courage, said the tailor's son. Oh, dear, no, answered the proud boy. It only takes a lot of cowardice not to. And then, turning his eyes down again, he softly walked away. End of The Proud Boy by Mrs. W. K. Clifford Read by Jill Preston the Rainbow Maker by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow Maker. The children stood under an archway 
Behind them was the blue sky, in front of them the clear still lake, that wandered and wound about the garden. Above their heads the leaves of a tree whispered, and told strange stories to the breeze. Poor tree! It is sighing for the blossoms the wind has carried away, they said to each other, and they looked back at the garden. And poor flowers, too, they said. All your bright colors are gone, and your petals lie scattered on the ground. Tomorrow they will be dead. Ah, no, the flowers sighed. The rainbow maker will gather them up, and once more they will see the sun. Before the children could answer, a tall, fair maiden came down the pathway. They could see her plainly in the twilight. Her eyes were dim with gathering tears, but on her lips there was a smile that came and went and flickered round her mouth. All down her back hung her pale golden hair. Round her neck was a kerchief of many colors. Her dress was soft and white, and her snowy apron was gathered up in one hand. She looked neither to the right nor to the left. She did not utter a single word, and the children could hear no sound of her footstep, no rustling from her dress. She stooped, and picking up the fading petals, looked at them tenderly for a moment, while the tears fell slowly down her cheeks, but the smile hovered round her mouth, for she knew that they would shine again in the sight of their beloved son. When her apron was quite full, she turned round and left the garden. Hand in hand, the children followed. She went slowly on by the side of the lake, far, far away, across the meadows, and up the farthest hill, until at last she found her home behind a cloud just opposite the sun. There she sat all through the summer days making rainbows. When the children had watched her for a long, long time, they went softly back to their own home. The rainbow maker had not even seen them. Mother, they said one day, we know now where the colors go from the flowers. See, they are there. And as they spoke, they thought of the maiden sitting silently at work in her cloud home. They knew that she was weeping at sending forth her most beautiful one, and yet smiling as she watched the soft archway she had made. See? They are all there, dear mother, the children repeated, looking at the falling rain and the shining sun and pointing to the rainbow that spanned the river. End of The Rainbow Maker by Mrs. W. K. Clifford Read by Jill Preston Fairy Tales by the Brothers Grimm The Salad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As a merry young huntsman was once going briskly along through a wood, there came up a little old woman and said to him, Good day, good day. You seem merry enough, but I am hungry and thirsty. Do pray give me something to eat. The huntsman took pity on her, and put his hand in his pocket, and gave her what he had. Then he wanted to go his way, but she took hold of him, and said, Listen, my friend, to what I am going to tell you. I will reward you for your kindness. Go your way, and after a little time you will come to a tree, where you will see nine birds sitting on a cloak. Shoot into the midst of them, and one will fall down dead. The cloak will fall too. Take it. It is a wishing cloak, and when you wear it, you will find yourself at any place where you may wish to be. Cut open the dead bird, take out its heart, and keep it, 
and you will find a piece of gold under your pillow every morning when you rise. It is the bird's heart that will bring you this good luck. The huntsman thanked her, and thought to himself, If all this does happen, it will be a fine thing for me. When he had gone a hundred steps or so, he heard a screaming and chirping in the branches over him, and looked up and saw a flock of birds pulling a cloak with their bills and feet, screaming, fighting, and tugging at each other, as if each wished to have it to himself. Well, said the huntsman, this is wonderful. This happens just as the old woman said. Then he shot into the midst of them, so that their feathers flew all about. Off went the flock chattering away, but one fell down dead, and the cloak with it. Then the huntsman did as the old woman told him, cut open the bird, took out the heart, and carried the cloak home with him. The next morning when he awoke he lifted up his pillow, and there lay the piece of gold glittering underneath. The same happened next day, and indeed every day when he arose. He heaped up a great deal of gold, and at last thought to himself, Of what use is this gold to me whilst I am at home? I will go out into the world and look about me. Then he took leave of his friends, and hung his bag and bow about his neck, and went his way. It so happened that his road one day led through a thick wood, at the end of which was a large castle in a green meadow, and at one of the windows stood an old woman with a very beautiful young lady by her side looking about them. Now the old woman was a witch, and said to the young lady, There is a young man coming out of the wood who carries a wonderful prize. We must get it away from him, my dear child, for it is more fit for us than for him. He has a bird's heart that brings a piece of gold under his pillow every morning. Meantime the huntsman came nearer and looked at the lady, and said to himself, I have been travelling so long that I should like to go into this castle and rest myself, for I have money enough to pay for anything I want. But the real reason was that he wanted to see more of the beautiful lady. Then he went into the house and was welcomed kindly, and it was not long before he was so much in love that he thought of nothing else but looking at the lady's eyes and doing everything that she wished. Then the old woman said, Now is the time for getting the bird's heart. So the lady stole it away, and he never found any more gold under his pillow, for it lay now under the young lady's, and the old woman took it away every morning. But he was so much in love that he never missed his price. Well, said the old witch, we have got the bird's heart, but not the wishing cloak yet, and that we must also get. Let us leave him that, said the young lady. He has already lost his wealth. Then the witch was very angry and said, Such a cloak is a very rare and wonderful thing, and I must and will have it. So she did as the old woman told her, and set herself at the window, and looked about the country and seemed very sorrowful. Then the huntsman said, What makes you so sad? Alas, dear sir, said she, Yonder lies the granite rock, where all the costly diamonds grow, and I want so much to go there, that whenever I think of it I cannot help being sorrowful. For who can reach it? Only the birds and the flies. Man cannot. If that's all your grief, said the huntsman, I'll take you there with all my heart. And he drew her under his cloak, and the moment he wished to be on the granite mountain they were both there. The diamonds glittered so on all sides that they were delighted with the sight, and picked up the finest. But the old witch made a deep sleep come upon him, and he said to the young lady, Let us sit down and rest ourselves a little. I am so tired that I cannot stand any longer. So they sat down, and he laid his head in her lap and fell asleep. And whilst he was sleeping on, she took the cloak from his shoulders, hung it on her own, picked up the diamonds, and wished herself home again. When he awoke, he found that his lady had tricked him, and left him alone on the wild rock. He said, Alas, what roguery there is in the world! And there he sat in great grief and fear, not knowing what to do. Now this rock belonged to fierce giants who lived upon it, and as he saw three of them striding about, he thought to himself, I can only save myself by feigning to be asleep. 
so he laid himself down as if he were in a sound sleep. When the giants came up to him, the first pushed him with his foot and said, "'What worm is this that lies here curled up? Tread upon him and kill him,' said the second. "'It's not worth the trouble,' said the third. "'Let him live. He'll go climbing higher up the mountain, and some cloud will come rolling and carry him away.' And they passed on, but the huntsman had heard all they said and as soon as they were gone he climbed to the top of the mountain, and when he had sat there a short time a cloud came rolling around him, and caught him in a whirlwind, and bore him along for some time, till it settled in a garden, and he fell quite gently to the ground amongst the greens and cabbages. Then he looked around him and said, I wish I had something to eat. If not I shall be worse off than before, for here I see neither apples nor pears, nor any kind of fruits, nothing but vegetables. At last he thought to himself, I can eat salad, it will refresh and strengthen me. So he picked out a fine salad and ate of it. But scarcely had he swallowed two bites that he felt himself quite changed, and so with horror that he was turned into an ass. However, he still felt very hungry, and the salad tasted very nice, so he ate on till he came to another kind of salad and scarcely had he tasted it, when he felt another change come over him, and soon saw that he was lucky enough to have found his old shape again. Then he laid himself down and slept off a little of his weariness, and when he awoke the next morning he broke off a head both of the good and the bad salad, and thought to himself, This will help me to my fortune again, and enable me to pay off some folks for their treachery. So he went away to try and find the castle of his friends, and after wandering about a few days he luckily found it. Then he stained his face all over brown, so that even his mother would not have known him, and went into the castle and asked for a lodging. I am so tired, said he, that I can go no farther. Countryman, said the witch, who are you, and what is your business? I am, said he, a messenger sent by the king to find the finest salad that grows under the sun. I have been lucky enough to find it and have brought it with me, but the heat of the sun scorches so that it begins to wither, and I don't know that I can carry it farther. When the witch and the young lady heard of his beautiful salad, they longed to taste it, and said, Dear countryman, let us just taste it. To be sure, answered he, I have two heads of it with me, and will give you one. So he opened his bag and gave them the bad. Then the witch herself took it into the kitchen to be dressed, and when it was ready she could not wait till it was carried up. She took a few leaves immediately and put them in her mouth, and scarcely were they swallowed when she lost her own form and ran braying down into the court in the form of an ass. Now the servant-maid came into the kitchen, and seeing the salad ready was going to carry it up, but on the way she too felt a wish to taste it as the old woman had done, and ate some leaves. So she also was turned into an ass and ran after the other, letting the dish with the salad fall on the ground. The messenger sat all this time with the beautiful young lady, and as nobody came with the salad and she longed to taste it, she said, I don't know where the salad can be. Then he thought something must have happened and said, I will go into the kitchen and see. And as he went he saw two asses in the court running about and the salad lying on the ground. All right, said he. Those two have had their share. Then he took up the rest of the leaves, laid them on the dish, and brought them to the young lady, saying, I bring you the dish myself that you may not wait any longer. So she ate of it, and like the others, ran off into the court, braying away. Then the huntsman washed his face and went into the court that they might know him. Now you shall be paid for your roguery, said he, and tied them all three to a robe, and took them along with him, till he came to a mill, and knocked at the window. "'What's the matter?' said the miller. "'I have three tiresome beasts here,' said the other. "'If you will take them, give them food and room, and treat them as I tell you, I will pay you whatever you ask.' "'With all my heart,' said the miller. "'But how shall I treat them?' Then the huntsman said, "'Give the old one stripes three times a day, and hay once. Give the next, who is the servant-maid, stripes once a day and hay three times 
and give the youngest, who is the beautiful lady, hay three times a day and no stripes, for he could not find it in his heart to have her beaten. After this he went back to the castle, where he found everything he wanted. Some day after, the miller came to him and told him that the old ass was dead. The other two, said he, are alive and eat, but are so sorrowful that they cannot last long. Then the huntsman pitied them, and told the miller to drive them back to him, and when they came he gave them some of the good salad to eat. And the beautiful young lady fell upon her knees before him and said, O oh, dearest huntsman, forgive me all the ill I've done you. My mother forced me to it. It was against my will, for I always loved you very much. Your wishing cloak hangs up in the closet, and as for the bird's heart, I will give it you too. But he said, Keep it. It will be just the same thing, for I mean to make you my wife. So they were married, and lived together very happily till they died. End of the Salad by the Brothers Grimm The Sandy Cat by Mrs. W. K. Clifford This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sandy Cat The Sandy Cat sat by the kitchen fire. Yesterday it had had no supper. This morning everyone had forgotten it. All night it had caught no mice. All day, as yet, it had tasted no milk. A little gray mouse, a saucer full of milk, a few fish or chicken bones would have satisfied it. But no gray mouse, with its soft, stringy tail behind it, ran across the floor. No milk was near, no chicken bones, no fish, no anything. The serving maid had been washing clothes and was hanging them out to dry. The children had loitered on their way to school and were wondering what the master would say to them. The father had gone to the fair to help a neighbor to choose a horse. The mother sat making a patchwork quilt. No one thought of the sandy cat. It sat by the fire alone and hungry. At last the clothes were all a-drying. The children had been scolded, and sat learning a lesson for the morrow. The father came from the fair, and the patchwork quilt was put away. The serving maid put on a white apron with a frill and a clean cap, then taking the sandy cat in her arms, said, Pussy, shall we go into the garden? So they went and walked up and down, up and down the pathway till at last they stopped before a rose tree. The serving maid held up the cat to smell the roses, but with one long bound it leaped from her arms and away, away, away. Whither? Ah, dear children, I cannot tell, for I was not there to see. But if ever you are a sandy cat, you will know that it is a terrible thing to be asked to smell roses when you are longing for a saucerful of milk and a gray mouse with a soft, stringy tail. End of The Sandy Cat by Mrs. W. K. Clifford Read by Jill Preston Fairy Tales by the Brothers Grimm The Turnip This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There were two brothers who were both soldiers. The one was rich and the other poor. The poor man thought he would try to better himself. So, pulling off his red coat, he became a gardener and dug his ground well and sowed turnips. When the seed came up, there was one plant bigger than all the rest, and it kept getting larger and larger, and seemed as if it would never cease growing, so that it might have been called the Prince of Turnips, for there never was such a one seen before, and never will again. At last it was so big that it filled a cart, 
and two oxen could hardly draw it and the gardener knew not what in the world to do with it nor whether it would be a blessing or a curse to him one day he said to himself what shall i do with it if i sell it it will bring no more than another and for eating the little turnips are better than this the best thing perhaps is to carry it and give it to the king as a mark of respect then he yoked his oxen and drew his turnip to the court and gave it to the king what a wonderful thing said the king i have seen many strange things but such a monster as this i never saw where did you get the seed or is it only your good luck if so you are a true child of fortune ah no answered the gardener i am no child of fortune i am a poor soldier who never could get enough to live upon so i laid aside my red coat and set to work tilling the ground i have a brother who is rich and your majesty knows him well and all the world knows him but because i am poor everybody forgets me the king then took pity on him and said you shall be poor no longer i will give you so much that you shall be even richer than your brother then he gave him gold and lands and flocks and made him so rich that his brother's fortune could not at all be compared with his when the brother heard all of this and how a turnip had made the gardener so rich he envied him sorely and bethought himself how he could contrive to get the same good fortune for himself however he determined to manage more cleverly than his brother and got together a rich present of gold and fine horses for the king and thought he must have a much larger gift in return for if his brother had received so much for only a turnip what must his present be worth the king took the gift very graciously and said he knew not what to give in return more valuable and wonderful than the great turnip so the soldier was forced to put it into a cart and drag it home with him when he reached home he knew not upon whom to vent his rage and spite and at length wicked thoughts came into his head and he resolved to kill his brother so he hired some villains to murder him and having shown them where to lie in ambush he went to his brother and said dear brother i have found a hidden treasure let us go and dig it up and share it between us the other had no suspicion of his roguery so they went out together and as they were travelling along the murderers rushed out upon him bound him and were going to hang him on a tree but whilst they were getting all ready they heard the trampling of a horse at a distance which so frightened them that they pushed their prisoner neck and shoulder together into a sack and swung him up by a cord to the tree where they left him him dangling and ran away meanwhile he worked and worked away till he made a hole large enough to put out his head when the horseman came up he proved to be a student a merry fellow who was journeying along on his nag and singing as he went as soon as the man in the sack saw him passing under the tree he cried out good morning good morning to thee my friend the student looked about everywhere and seeing no one and not knowing where the voice came from cried out who calls me then the man in the tree answered lift up thine eyes for behold here i sit in the sack of wisdom here have i in a short time learned great and wondrous things compared to this seat all the learning of the schools is as empty air a little longer and i shall know all that man can know and shall come forth wiser than the wisest of mankind here i discern the signs and motions of the heavens and the stars the laws that control the winds the number of the sands on the seashore the healing of the sick the virtues of all simples of birds and of precious stones wert thou but once here my friend thou wouldst feel and own the power of knowledge the student listened to all this and wondered much at last he said blessed be the day and hour when i found you 
cannot you contrive to let me into the sack for a little while then the other answered as if very unwillingly a little space i may allow thee to sit here if thou wilt reward me well and entreat me kindly but thou must tarry yet an hour below till i have learned some little matters that are yet unknown to me so the student sat himself down and waited a while but the time hung heavy upon him and he begged earnestly that he might ascend forthwith for his thirst of knowledge was great then the other pretended to give way and said thou must let the sack of wisdom descend by untying yonder cord and then thou shalt enter so the student let him down opened the sack and set him free now then cried he let me ascend quickly as he began to put himself into the sack heels first wait a while said the gardener that is not the way then he pushed him in head first tied up the sack and soon swung up the searcher after wisdom dangling in the air how is it with thee friend said he dost thou not feel that wisdom comes unto thee rest there in peace till thou art a wiser man than thou wert so saying he trotted off on the student's nag and left the poor fellow to gather wisdom till somebody should come and let him down end of the turnip by the brothers grim The Wooden Doll by Mrs. W. K. Clifford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wooden Doll. The Wooden Doll had no peace. My dears, if ever you are a doll, hope to be a rag doll or a wax doll or a doll full of sawdust apt to ooze out or a china doll easy to break anything in the world rather than a good strong wooden doll with a painted head and movable joints for that is indeed a sad thing to be many a time the poor wooden doll wished it were a tin train or a box of soldiers or a woolly lamb or anything on earth rather than what it was it never had any peace it was taken up and put down at all manners of odd moments made to go to bed when the children went to bed to get up when they got up be bathed when they were bathed dressed when they were dressed taken out in all weathers stuffed into their satchels when they went to school left about in corners dropped on stairs forgotten neglected bumped banged broken glued together anything and everything it suffered until many a time it said sadly enough to its poor little self i might as well be a human being at once and be done with it and then it fell to thinking about human beings what strange creatures they were always going about though none carried them save when they were very little, always sleeping and waking and eating and drinking and laughing and crying and talking and walking and doing this and that and the other, never resting for long together or seeming as if they could be still for even a single day. They are always making a noise thought the wooden doll they are always talking and walking about always moving things and doing things building up and pulling down and making and unmaking forever and forever and never are they quiet it is lucky that we are not all human beings or the world would be worn out in no time and there would not be a corner left in which to rest a poor doll's head. End of The Wooden Doll by Mrs. W. K. Clifford
Read by Jill Preston.